Let's just quickly start here. I thought I'd post this job posting that I keep uh, getting sort of things in my mailbox. This is an interesting one. The mail of high told you because the requirement is to go work in Shanghai with a PhD. But what I thought you should know is if you're a well known company, the ASF, plastics company and general chemical company, and what I thought you point out, unfortunately, the text doesn't show up very well here on the background. What you can expect in this career is to provide statistical support based on data analysis, database modeling, and optimization. Three of the courses that you're taking now are on the year. This comprises chemometrics, biometrics, process, and quality control. We're going to talk about quality control in the last section of this course. Um, we're going to talk about Six Sigma and quality control. And then it says here that you'll be responsible for projects, research, and development. You'll communicate the ideas and solutions to a broad range of non-statisticians. Okay. Which is why you always see in the questions in the assignments, how do you explain what you've learned here in this course to people whose background is statistically implied? What to expect here in the middle column then is, uh, it's obviously part of the course about a PhD in chemistry or chemical engineering. You have a strong background in mathematics and statistics. You have experience in these statistical software such as R, Jump, and SAS. So the first one that they mentioned is R over there. Jump and SAS are two commercial versions that do exactly the same as R. So you're learning an important software tool that is, is recognized in companies, which is why I've selected R for this course. Intab is also a good alternative, but R is And that R value, 
R of xk with R of xk plus 1 is going to be a number less than 1 this time. It's going to start moving down in strength of correlation. And if we plot it against xk plus 2, the spread grows even more. xk plus 3, and successive correlations of the variable with itself at the longer lag time gets weaker and weaker. So that R value drops off with successive points in time. Yeah, this is a way to check for new chaos. Yeah, so what this is heading to is what would this curve look like if they were independent versus what it looks like when it's not independent. So in fact, what this upper plot is showing you is the correlation values, that R value with successive lag. So when the lag is zero, you notice the first bar always peaks at one. You take a look at the second column in the middle, the R value at zero lag is one, Third example, R value at zero lag is one. Always at zero lag, it's identity. So we don't need to concern ourselves with that. But what we do interest ourselves on are the lag strengths at successive values from one, two, three upwards. Now there is a point beyond which the lags will become insignificant. Now let's bear in mind that even if you take two totally random data sets, the temperature in this room, and plot the correlation of the temperature in this room versus the correlation of the temperature in another room in, in Africa, you're going to get two totally unrelated variables there, but you will still see a non-zero R. Okay? Just by the nature of data, you will never get perfect zeros here. So what we do is we establish an upper and lower bound within which we say that correlation is statistically insignificant. And there's a bunch of theory in defining where that line is. So here the line happens to be at 20%. So 20% in weaker correlations are deemed to be insignificant, and we can ignore them. So here in the first data set, we can notice it takes about 15 samples, 16 perhaps, before the data become insignificantly correlated. So the strength of the relationship between successive variables is such that you can predict with some accuracy about 10 to 15 lags into the future. This is really powerful. Those of you that can work in economic data, energy markets, modeling energy data, stock market pricing, you can take stock market data and predict several steps ahead of time what the trend of the curve is going to be using exactly simply this basic, basic autocorrelation function. So what this shows me is how well I am able to predict it this one I can predict up to about 14 different lags. This data set over here has a lot of scatter, a lot of, or I should say, low amount of water correlation. It's only got water correlation significant like the first lag. And then finally, this last example shows a strong oscillatory behavior above and below zero, and that's indicated quite carefully with a strong negative at lag one indicating that if I'm above zero now, the next point in time I'm going to be below zero, and then I'm going to be above zero, and then below zero, and then above and below. This is sort of the operator who's overcompensating. They open the valve too much, and then they close it a bit. And they close it too much, then they open it again, but then they overshot it. Okay. We often see this in um, processes as well. So I, I mentioned these three sorts of time series plots because Unfortunately, we don't cover time series course in the chemical engineering curriculum. You can take it as an elective in economics um, school, business school, but we don't cover it in engineering, and unfortunately, it's got really strong, strong benefits for those of you that go ahead and model um, time-based data, which is pretty much all, all the data we deal with has some time-based elements. So bear that in mind, and one way you can then judge whether your data are independent is if you plot the autocorrelation function and there's essentially no autocorrelation after lag one and upwards, then your data are independent of each other. Another way you can use this result is let's just take this, this middle case. It says the data are related to lag one. And then the second lag is zero. 
Well, one way you can then make an independent data set of this is to take every second sample. Because then your data two steps apart will not related to each other. Okay, I'll use this, come back to this concept again when we talk about quality control in the last session, of course. With this first example, you would have to take data points that are about 15 to 16 <coughs> steps apart in time in order to get true independence. Now, R will do all this work for you of fitting all those iterative regression models, calculating the R values, and it does it all with one function called ACF, autocorrelation function. So you give it a vector of data, and it will calculate those ACF curve for you and generate what essentially this first, uh, these plots that are in the first row of the plot. Now, the other problem we'll face with our regression models is that we may not actually specify them correctly. Up to now, we've assumed we've done a good job of telling R what our model is, but in fact, it may not be linear. So, when you notice non-linearity in the model, you need to consider that and refit your model. So, here's, here's, a, here's an example of a model that has significant curvature. And we see that raw data points here come from a region that sort of has a quadratic shape. Now what I'm telling you for many engineering processes, you may know that you're, from a theoretical perspective there's a quadratic relationship in the data. But it might be that the region where you want to use the model, the linear approximation is pretty good. So if your intention is only to have to use this model between the range of six and eight units, let's say there's like a pH, you know that pH is about a non-linear relationship to uh, one of the variables in our process, the y. But if, as long as we stay between six and eight, we can just pretty much get by with the linear model. And that's illustrating that this linear tangent works good enough over the range that you're going to use it. If we were to use the model over a wider range, then we will have to go with the results to non the model. So we can easily work with nonlinear models though in R, but the first thing we need to do is let's see how we can detect that we in fact have nonlinear. So one of the ways we do it is we plot the residuals on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we plot either the x variable itself or the y predicted, y hat, or y fitted. Those are the same, same words for the same thing. So y hat, y predicted, or uh, the fitted values. And the reason why that works is, let's take a look back at our model, y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus the residuals e. Let's say the true, that, that's what we fit, but let's say, for example, the true relationship is plus beta 2 x squared. So there's this additional term, this quadratic effect of x, that we forgot to add to the model. We didn't fit beta 2. Well, what's going to happen is that this is going to get bumped up into the residuals. If we didn't add beta 2 to my model, it's going to light land up in the residuals, and that's why we plot the residuals on the vertical axis. And what we look for then is any curvature or any structure in that plot. So when we plot the residuals E on the y axis against the x values on the horizontal axis, we're looking for no structure. And fortunately, our eye is very good at picking up no structure. And we can also plot E versus Y hat. <coughs> now, when we observe some structure in that plot, we then need to go and say, let's go fit some nonlinear terms because it indicates that there is something there in the data that we omitted. And the shape that you see in this residual plot is going to give you some guidance as to what you've omitted. So this quadratic curvature here indicates I've omitted a quadratic term. So 
So we go ahead and we add that to, to the model as a new variable. And that's what the latter half of today's lecture and next week, uh, the week after reading is about, is adding additional terms to the model. So I'll show you how we can then accommodate now this third term for beta 2. But there is one way we can deal with this, um, and that's using non-linearly squares. We won't touch on it in this course. It's a, it's a complex topic that would take about six weeks or so of study and analysis. So I don't want to go down that path because also I'll argue that very few of our models actually require non-linearly squares to make them work. We can get by with well, a few small changes to our data and avoid the complexity of non-linear modeling. However, if you do want to apply non-linear modeling, R and all these other statistical packages such as SAS and JUMP have a variety of non-linear fittings built into it. So what we'll look at instead then is transformations of variables. I spoke on this uh, last class. Essentially, what we're saying is we may need to add a transform variable to our data set where we take my original data, raise it to some power p, and then we use that new, new transform variable in my model instead. Okay, so what this boils down to then is we notice there's some structure in this plot. So once I notice this structure in here, I recognize I need to go modify this model. So one way, for example, might be to erase x to some power p and fit that model instead. And then we go re-inspect these residuals. So after I rebuild the model, these will be a different set of residuals. Go we'll plot them against x, and go we'll plot those residuals against y hat, and look we'll at structure. If there's still structure remaining, I may go well increase the power of p that I used there earlier. So I may have used the power of 2, I may need to go to 2.5, 3, why well, need to in fact go the other way, I need to go down, down the ladder of power. So what I illustrated here is what we call the ladder of powers, where we go either to more and more negative or you get up to more and more positive. Okay, so you go from one up to two. Pretty much I, I've never seen people have to go beyond two and minus two. So it's pretty much somewhere in the range of minus two to plus two that you need to And you can also apply this not only to x, but you can also apply it to y. Now, I will show you how to do this in R automatically. You don't need to go do this manually ahead of time. R will take care of all of that calculation for us, fit the model, and present the results to us. And I'll show you that's it's very straightforward. The other thing to bear in mind is that we often have an intuition of the nonlinearity in our model. This was one example that I used very successfully at Metro Canada uh, about 10 years ago, where we were trying to predict the vapor pressure from the distillation column. Now, the vapor pressure we know from chemical engineering uh, is predicted using the Anton equation. Well, one way of predicting the vapor pressure is the Anton equation. And for the non chemical engineers, what that comes down to is that the temperature is inversely related to the log of the vapor pressure. So if you had gone and fit a model of the form where you use temperature over here, so some slope plus beta 1 times the temperature plus beta 2 times the pressure, that model would give you some sort of prediction. Oh, sorry, no. Let's just deal with this case here. That model there, just using the temperature by itself, would give you some reasonable prediction. However, if you have put a model where you say y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 divided by temperature, your model improves fairly substantially. Because from a theoretical perspective, and y variable is inversely related to temperature. So what we do is we simply plug in the inverse temperature, the 
this beta 1 coefficient now takes on a different meaning, has different units, has a different value and a different confidence interval, but the residuals from the second model are a lot smaller. The standard error from the second model is a lot smaller. Maybe we can take this a step further and be a little bit smarter still and recognize that the temperature is inversely related to the log of the vapor pressure. So if I'm trying to predict the vapor pressure y, I should rather predict log of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 of the temperature. And that third model will be even better than the second or the first one. Essentially what we've done is we've taken a nonlinear transformation of my raw data and still used regular least squares. Least squares doesn't know that these terms have been changed. To least squares perspective, this is simply just another data set that you're fitting. This is log of y over here as before. It sees that as your y variable. Beta 0 is an intercept plus beta 1 times 1 over temperature. That's just x to the least squares model, to the software's perspective. So you've done nothing really different. The software is just being fooled into using a slightly different data set that has better properties. Okay, so these are, these are concepts that you're comfortable with writing from the previous statistics course as well, given that most of you seem to find this, this is straightforward. Um, other transformations are shown here. If we've got a variable p multiplied by a variable x, we can take logs and separate that out and then land up with a form that's also y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x. Uh, here's another nonlinear term. We can simply invert the left and the right hand side and we can linearize that into a form y equals beta 0 plus beta 1x. So applying nonlinear transformations from theory are an easy way to improve. That's the regular model, y as described by x. 
Now, you may wonder why I've never spoken about the intersect. I will automatically add for you but the way that you can force a model that only has an intercept and no slope is quite interesting. You can tell R, there will be a linear model where Y is described by 1. And it will in fact, but it's forcing X to be here's a Y. And so then the slope, that, that slope that it's estimating is it in fact E0. So that forces a model that is a pure intercept over the model. The second example, I will automatically add the plus one on for you. You don't have to specify that. But then people always ask, well, how can I force my slope, uh, sorry, how can I force my intercept to be zero? So in other words, I want to fit a model with E1x, and I want x to pass through the origin. And that you can do by simply adding plus zero. So we have the force R in that way. Non-linear transformations are are done in this manner, y as described by square root of x, for example. Or if you want to go a log transformation of y, you say log of y as described by x. So R will then take the log transform, fit the model, and present the answer to you. You don't have to do any of the that work and um, maintenance itself. There is one very insidious example of where R will do the work for you and then do the wrong thing and you won't know that it's done the wrong thing. And it's a very unfortunate case where if you don't know how R's mechanics work, um, you'll land up in the trap. And that's if you're using transformations such as the following. If you want to say Y is described by an intercept plus V1 over X, naively you might go ahead and say, give me a model with Y is by one divided by x. And it will work, it will build a model, but in fact it will build a model, we'll very quickly realize it, though, that all it's done is fit a model where you can fit only the intercept. In other words, it's gone just and done that part. Okay, there won't be an error message, there won't be a warning, but you'll quickly realize when you start to analyze the R squares and the standard error that something is kind of gone wrong. What you need to do is you need to wrap up that transformation into the I operator. So if you go to R, uh, you can see the I operator, it's called the as is operator. And you can get a bit of a sense of that to say help I, um, help I tells you over here, it's the as is operator, and it will, the help it says it indicates that it should be treated as is. In other words, it forces I to go use that and as is. In other words, fit a model where x is in the denominator. The same thing for any transformation on the right hand side, such that they involve squares. So i, x raised to the power 2. It just enforces r to fit that on the new model. Any questions up to this point? Any transformations?
but we're going to get far more interesting models and far more useful models if we can build models that extend further. Now you may think to yourself that I could get away with the following. You could go fit another model, y equals, uh, let's call this b02 plus beta2 x2. In other words, instead of adding this term into the first model, you say, well, I'm just going to build another model in parallel that involves x2. And that's going to give you the understanding of x2 as it relates to y. This model here in the box, in other words, ignoring this one, that first model over here in the box is going to give you an understanding of how this single variable, let's just go back to our original notation x, how is that single variable x1 related to y? The second model will give you an understanding of how x2 is related to y. But you'll never have an understanding of how x1 and x2 um, jointly affect y. And in fact, this approach of building two parallel models is wasteful of degrees of freedom. So we're going to take a look at, at extending our models into multiple variables in this section. And what it does is we will learn how to interpret those models. Those slope coefficients now, V1 and V2, actually have a very subtle, different meaning than when we build a model with the variable on its own. We'll be able to improve our predictions. That's a really important part of this section, is recognizing that predicting this y over here with just a single x, you're going to get good enough predictions. Build predicting this y with just this x, the second x, you're going to get just good enough predictions. But combining them together, you're going to get improved predictions. And the third thing why we need this mechanism is when we start to deal with integer variables. So what I mean by this is, let's say you want to build a regression model that predicts the output as a function of the reactor that you use on the mixing tank. So you might have mixing tank 1, mixing tank 2, mixing tank 3. Or you might have operator A, B, C, and D, but four operators in the process. On the day of the week, there's seven days in the week. So how do you deal with integer variables in your data set? That's going to be an important topic. Many experiments are binary in that nature. So you use polymer A or polymer B. So we need to know how to deal with discrete data. And that's another reason why we will look at this section. Okay, so we're killing two birds with one stone. And this is also a great intro into design experiments. OK, now. <laughs> We're going to do something that might throw you off a little bit initially, but I'll prove to you that it actually has no effect. We're going to, before we even build our model, before R or whatever software touches the data, we're going to subtract our center point. Because many times the center point is useless. It, it has no benefit to us. We can always recover our center point after the fact. So using the center point in the model simply makes our life a little more complex. So if we can make our life a little simpler, we try to do that. So here's the deal. There's your original b squares model with one variable. Y, I is your output variable. X, I is your input variable. We know that if we write this data set point at average, X bar, Y bar always passes through the b squares model. We can subtract the first equation and the second equation, and we're left with Notice the blue knots disappear when you do subtraction. So now, if I use this as my y variable, so y minus y bar becomes my y variable, and x minus x bar becomes my x variable, I fit a model that will be guaranteed to go through the zero zero point. Okay, we can get, I'll guarantee that for you based on the fact that now um, my new center is 0, and my new center x is 0, my new center y is 0. So that will be will come out naturally. And I only have to estimate one parameter, v1. So by doing this small additional work ahead of time, 
I reduce my problem from estimating the slope and the intercept to simply just estimating the slope. If you really, really want to recover that intercept afterwards, you just follow this process backwards and you can back calculate the mean multiples. One, one line. But what I'm arguing here is that knowing what mean naught is is almost never useful. How many models have you built where the intercept has actually been of any interpretable value to you? And if it is of interpretable value to you, you can always recover the back part of the fact. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to start moving to matrix notation because, as you can imagine, if we start adding more variables to a model, my data set is going to grow bigger and bigger and it's easier to work with vectors and matrices than it is to work with the symbols themselves. So this is going to drag you kicking and screaming back to second year and some math textbooks and calculating not only x transpose x, x transpose x inverse, but I'm going to force you to understand what x transpose x means. What does x transpose x mean? interpret that is going to be important. If you don't understand what that means, the next five, six weeks are not going to make any sense for you. Um, so we really do need to go back to some basic terminology. Okay, so let me let me uh, lead you into this story. We're going to consider the general case where we've got one x variable and two x variables x variables. So this k is the number of parameters we're going to estimate. Up to now, you've just dealt with this first x, y, i is equal to beta 1 plus x, and everything else has disappeared after that. So what we're doing is we're adding a beta 2 x 2 term that's new, and a beta 3 x 3 term up to as many as we like. Call that k. We're going to add k u, k u parameters to our model. Now, that's the equation for one data point in my data set. If I would like to write this in matrix form, simply break up this line, that's one line in the rows, break up into two vectors, a horizontal x vector and this vertical beta vector. We're going to call this x transpose beta x transpose because it's lying horizontally. Our vectors by definition are always vertical. So when we transpose them, they become horizontal. So x transpose and beta is a vertical value. k entries in x, k entries in beta, so we get a one by one scalar after this. Add on our error and we get our connection. That's for one data point. Now, we're going to have n data points in my data set. So, let's perhaps give a concrete example of this before we go a little bit further and isolate the number. It might be that in a reactor, you're able to predict y, which is the pH. I'm oh, sorry, let's, let's use viscosity. Is equal to some parameter beta 1 times x, and x1 here might be temperature. Plus beta 2, x2, and x2 might be pH. So our goal here is to simply estimate beta 1, the effect of temperature, and beta 2, the effect of pH. So what I need to go do to do this work, I need to go collect a whole bunch of data. I need to go collect data on the viscosity. I need to go collect data on the temperature, which we call x1. And I need to go collect data on the pH, which we call x2. So we're going to go do several lab experiments and measure those three data points that come from one experiment. Then do another experiment at a different temperature, different pH, and I'm going to get a different viscosity. <coughs> I'm going to keep doing this, and I'm going to do it in fact. Notice I've got two 
variables I'm estimating. So in this case, k is equal to 2. And I'm going to add n data points, or n rows. So n is the number of experiments I do, or the data points I collect. k is the number of variables in my model. In this case, temperature and pH. We don't count those output variables in this cost. Number 
was in the matrix as the answer. Scalar was in the vector. X1 transpose Y. It's a scalar. So take the first column of X. This is X1. This is X2. If we take X1 transpose Y, we can visualize it as that times that, and then you simply do the regular dot product. So the product of that is a single number, a scalar. Let me ask you the following. What if I had put here x1 transpose x1? What does that represent? I mean, that's a slightly easier way to Remember, we centered our data. Okay. So we've already gone and subtracted off the mean here. So the average of this first column is zero, and the average of that second column is zero, because the data have been pre-centered. It's only an hour long, totally optional, but I highly recommend it to 